brothers and sisters, there were three African popes who came from the region of North Africa. And although there are no authentic portraits of these popes, there are drawings and references in the Catholic Encyclopedia as to their being of African background. And all our saints, all of those popes, accomplished many noble tasks during their papacy. However, this seems to be overlooked because of their ethnic background. Pope Saint Victor I, the 14th Pope from 189 to 199 AD. Saint Victor was born in the Roman province of Africa and bore a Latin name as most Africans in that area did at that time. He served during the reign of Emperor Septimus Servus of Rome, also African, who had led Roman legions in Britain. During his reign, he disputed over many religious practices, one of which was the date of Easter. In Rome, Easter was always observed on Sunday, but Asiatic churches observed Easter on the 14th day after the vernal equinox, regardless of the day of the week. This caused commotion between people celebrating Easter and fasting for Lent. So Pope Victor ordered all churches to celebrate Easter on the Sunday following the 14th day of the vernal equinox. In doing so, he suppressed any further outrage towards the church and was able to compromise with both parties, and thus reaffirming the holy feast of Easter to be held on Sunday as Pope Pius had done. He called Theophilus, Bishop of Alexandria, on the carpet for not doing this. He added acolytes to the attendance of the clergy. He was Pope for 10 years, two months and 10 days. Until Victor's time, Rome celebrated the Mass in Greek. Pope Victor changed the language to Latin, which was spoken in his native North Africa. Some reports say that he died a natural death, and others say that he was martyred. After his death, he was buried near the body of the Apostle Peter, the first Pope in the Vatican. Pope St. Victor the first feast day is July 28th. And then Lift every voice. I believe that human society stands under the judgment the of one God. Heaven, revealed to all and known by many names. It's creative power. It's visible in the mysteries of the universe. And the revolutionary Holy Spirit, which will not want people to endure injustice. Shackles of bondage in the rage of the powerless when they struggle to be free. It loud as the roar. And in the violence and conflict, which even now threaten to level the hills and the mountains. Stony the road. I believe that Jesus, the black Messiah, was a revolutionary leader sent by God to rebuild the black nation of Israel. in the day. To liberate black people from powerlessness and from the oppression, brutality, and exploitation of the white Gentile world. Felt with a stare. I believe that the revolutionary spirit of God embodied in the black Messiah is born anew in each generation. Come to the place for which I fight. And the black Christian nationalists constitute the living remnant of God's chosen people. Sing a song for In this day, and are charged by him with responsibility for the liberation of black people. Sing a song I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe that both my survival and my salvation depend upon my willingness to reject individualism. And so I commit my life to the liberation struggle of African people and accept the values, ethics, morals, and program of the black nation defined by that struggle and taught by the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church. Till victory is won. The radical nature of the American South the environment that nurtured me, its lush, fertile womb, 
that never meant to craft me in its image. Being raised in the South is the smell of a hot comb burning away my thick kinks, making me feel as white as the dolls I was never allowed to have. It's dawn on Sundays finding my grandmother reading from her Bible, the serpent-like hissing noise she made as she tried to whisper the verses to herself. The South is my sister's skin, like the glimmer from moonbeams that shine over waves of water at night. How one could never tell if it were simply just blue or black, but something in between. A color of its own creation. How I remember circling my arms around her smaller frame, burrowing myself into our attachment, imagining this must have been what we looked like in the womb. A bond forged from the knowledge that we had both coexisted in a place that no one else had ever been. It's my grandfather. Tears running curvy down his face as he tells the same drunken story about the genes he was never able to have as a boy. The way his father told him to go get a damn job. The fact that he worked every day of his life since. It's his far off gaze as he witnessed his grandchildren growing up to be everything he wasn't allowed. The unfortunate circumstance, in the way that he put it, of being born black in the wrong time. It's remembering the melancholy of having to go to the time-worn trailer in the middle of nowhere Opelousas. The surreal nature of the environment that fenced us in. Rain whipping down our backs, running for cover. The sound it made when it hit the aluminum roof, like millions of minuscule marbles falling from the atmosphere. When the floods subsided, we crawled from under our hiding places with sticks, waiting as crawfish would dig themselves from their tiny homes in the mud protruding their dwellings with the intent to see them materialize. We invite you to partake in our worship experience. Come with an open mind and an open heart. Sing, dance, and clap your hands. Follow us on all of our social media platforms. Giving is an opportunity for us to build community, ministry, health, and best self. Tap into your greatness that God has already placed inside of you and share it with the world. We would love to see you more often. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I've got a feeling everything's gonna be alright. Oh, I've got a feeling everything's gonna be alright.
As I open up this morning, I want to offer up something that, that might be that of a confession or a testimony of sorts. You see, I came to this message as I was meditating and reflecting uh, during Black History Month. And, and during the month of February, I had every intentions of filing this message away for next February. But as I was preparing, this message kept coming back to me. It came back with such an intensity that I knew that the revolutionary Holy Spirit was guiding me this morning to deliver this message in this moment and in this time. You see, I guess God was telling me that any time is the right time to tell our story. The title of our message this morning, brothers and sisters, is Reject the Lies. Our scripture comes from John chapter 14, verses 15 through 21, and it reads, If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives in you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. And on the day, you will realize that I am the Father, and the Father is in me, and I am in you. And whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by the Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Amen. And may God add a blessing to the readers, hearers, and doers of this holy word. You see, brothers and sisters, what the scripture is speaking to this morning is about our arriving at our spiritual destiny. And that it is not a matter of seeking a goal on our terms, but whether it is a question of, of whether or not we know Jesus and are seeking to know him seeking to understand that revolutionary Holy Spirit who is the standard bearer. Jesus in the scripture is reminding the disciples that he and God are one. And to see the African Messiah is to see God. You see, the words, the actions, and the teachings and miracles of Jesus all serve as proof of these concepts. Along with that, Jesus notes that that, that, that those who come after him will be able to do greater works than he has. And in context, this means that, 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 that the opportunity to reach more people than Jesus did during his public ministry exists. And to know that, that when a request is made in the name of the Messiah and in his line and aligned with his purpose and, is, and, and within his will, will it be granted. You see, Jesus makes a, a strong comment about the relationship between a person's love for Christ and their actions. He says that if, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Or in other words, you must put your words into action. Jesus also promises assistance in the revolutionary Holy Spirit, which, which we all know will be made available to believers who are active seekers in God's power. And for the first time, this promise was revealed was in the upper room just after Pentecost. A recurring theme in this scripture is Jesus' reminders that some of his words won't be fully understood until later. In this case, much of what Jesus says will only make sense after he is arrested, executed, and then resurrected. You see, he is telling the disciples these things in advance in a way to bolster their faith when these events come about. You see, the African Messiah Jesus is telling the disciples to lean in the truth 
of the revolutionary Holy Spirit. And it is only by leaning into this truth that we are able to reject the lies. Now, why is this scripture relevant for us today in our daily struggles? You see, brothers and sisters, we have been lied to. We have pre been presented with a falsehood. We have been raised to believe, or rather indoctrinated, into a world that says that as black people, we as people of African descent, we as African people, the lie is such that we have no value. It is a lie that has been told by institutions that have been westernized. You see, we have been lied to by now Western, westernized institutions that includes our schools, our churches, our synagogues, and our mosques, and even temples. You see, both black educators and white educators, leaders and politicians, and even preachers have joined in and perpetuated the big lie that says that we have no value. It is the lie that which is black inferiority. My brothers and sisters, if you don't believe me when I say it, then maybe you will believe the educator, Jane Elliott, who said, we don't educate people in this country. We indoctrinate them from kindergarten to 12th grade of the rightness of whiteness and the wrongness of everything else. She goes on to say, if you are white and don't understand your place of privilege in this country after 12 years of schooling, then you have failed history. I might add, brothers and sisters, if you are an African child born and educated in America and you are not clear about how this country devalues your life, then you have essentially failed history. You see, so often, when we are faced with the truth of our story here in America, so many of us say, I don't want to watch that story. It's too hard for me to watch. It saddens me to watch it. It makes me mad when I watch it and I'm angry at the world afterwards. But brothers and sisters, it is important to know our story for our story is a story of hope when it makes no sense to have hope. It's a story of perseverance and strength when most would break under the same conditions. It's a story of triumph. For not only are we here to tell our story, but we have created and innovated throughout the years. In fact, when we don't tell our stories to our children, we leave them vulnerable to the lies. You see, not telling our story to our children is child neglect. Brothers and sisters, as much as it is important for us to tell our story, it is also important for us to provide a context, for context matters. Let's take the story of Justice Thurgood Marshall. You see, the Howard University Law School graduate founded the NAAC Legal Defense Fund, where he argued several cases before the U.S. Supreme Court, including Brown versus Board of Education, which held that racial segregation in public schools is a violation of the Equal Protection Clause. And in 1961, President John F. Kennedy appointed Justice Marshall to the U.S. Court of Appeals. And in 1965, President Lyndon B. Johnson appointed Marshall as, as U.S. Solicitor General, followed by, in 1967, a successful appointment to the U.S. Supreme Court, making Justice Marshall the first African-American appointed to the position. As we acknowledge this glorious story, the story of Justice Marshall, it's a glorious story, yet today we continue to celebrate her glorious story, the story of Justice Katanji Brown Jackson who through her work and through her, through her work as a jur jurist embodies the spirit of her ancestor, Justice Thurgood Marshall. 
as she fought, fought against the injustices of her time. She battled the prison industrial complex and mass incarceration, which was born out of the demonization of black people. You see, Justice Brown Jackson fought what Michelle Alexander, Alexander refers to as the new Jim Crow. But in her most recent battle, it was with the Republican senators as she navigated an, un an unconscionably rigorous Senate, com Senate confirmation hearing, which was littered with racist, racist overtone. As we were angered by the questions and the many inflammatory statements, we also stood proud of Justice Brown Jackson as she kept her composure and responded firmly to all of the questions and statements, reaffirming her integrity and her fitness to do the job at hand. And as we celebrate, as we celebrate this success of the first African-American female to be successfully appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court, we celebrate our glorious story. But brothers and sisters, might I offer some context here? For it's not lost on me that it has taken far too long for this country to appoint an African-American woman, the highest educated demographic in this country, to the highest court in the land. We're talking 55 years since the appointment of Justice Thurgood Marshall to the bench. But let's, let us also take a look at the confirmation vote by comparison. Dating back to Justice Marshall's initial appointments, which were during the height of the Civil Rights Movement, juxtaposed today when we have supposedly arrived. You see, in 1961, Justice Marshall received an unchallenged recess appointment to the U.S. Court of Appeals, again, while in the throes of the Civil Rights Movement. In 1965, Marshall had a relatively quiet confirmation process as he was appointed U.S. Solicitor General. And a few weeks ago, as we were doing our walkthrough through Culture Center Number 1, our board chair, Reverend Hanifa, pointedly reminded us that Justice Marshall back in 1967 was confirmed to the U.S. Supreme Court with a vote of 69 to 11. And might I add, it was a six-hour hearing. Recently, Justice Brown Jackson's confirmation vote just a few weeks ago was 53 to 47. Might I add, 23 hours worth of hearings. Justice Marshall, 69 to 11 vote during the height of the Civil Rights Movement. Justice Brown Jackson, 53 to 47 during a time when we supposedly have arrived. Hmm. While some may say that we have come a long way, the numbers tell a sobering story that we have a whole lot more work to do. If we have no knowledge of our history, we are destined to repeat it. And it's destined to repeat, be repeated upon us. But also, I must state that we can ill afford to relax. For if we relax in the face of oppression, we are also destined to have our history repeated upon us. We have to look no further than the recent incident in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where a white police officer killed, shot in the back of the head, Patrick Leoya. You see, the Leoya family had moved from the Democratic Republic of Congo, Congo to the land of the free and the home of the brave in pursuit of all the promises and hope for a better future for their family, only to realize that all the freedoms and all the justice that were to be had was a misnomer. They were forced to face, to face the, 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 the harsh reality that freedom and justice for all in this country 
is the big lie. The notion that the, that, 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 the, that the world would witness Derek Chauvin's murdering George Floyd would shine a light that would force us to fix our broken criminal legal system. That is the big lie. And unfortunately today, we are facing the gruesome reality of another unarmed young black man being shot in the back of the head by a police officer. The police, again playing the role of judge, jury, and executioner, in this case has shattered the dreams of yet another African mother, another African father. You see, when the officer took this young brother's life, he was sending a message to us all, brothers and sisters, he perpetuated the big lie that black lives have no value. But brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you this morning, reject the lie. You see, as Reverend Hanifa reminded us of our story, she was also reminding us of our sense of responsibility to continue in the struggle as we stood in that sacred place that houses our story, that sacred place that houses our rich culture, that sacred place that houses our rich tradition that is the cultural center. She reminded us that any time is a good time and the right time to tell our story. A story that says that princess shall come out of Egypt and Ethiopia so stretch out her hand. The passage from Psalms 68 verse 31. It's important to note that it didn't say princess shall come out of Babylon. It didn't say that princes shall come out of Greece. It didn't say that princes shall come out of Rome. It said that princes shall rise out of the first civilized nation of the world, the first birthplace of all learning, a place of deep spirituality, this venerated place of power. Princes shall rise out of Egypt. So brothers and sisters, when you are confused and in the dark, and want to understand your place in this world. Look no further than this verse and you will know where your greatness comes from. You see, this text reminds us that Egypt and Ethiopia, which are squarely in Africa, are a part of God's master plan. Don't let their efforts to confound you, brothers and sisters. This is the truth as depicted in the Bible. Ethiopia, Alexandria, Cush, Nubia, Kemet were all a part of this ancient story. And know that today when we talk about Egypt and all of the advances in science and all the advances in math and architecture, we are talking about an African empire. You see, brothers and sisters, when Joseph and Mary went, went, went to hide in, in amongst their people so that they would go unrecognized, they were going to Africa. They went right into Africa amongst their people. When we realize the stories of the Bible are stories of African people, it forces you to, to not only read the Bible differently, but it forces us to reevaluate and understand our sense of purpose and our relationship to the Most High. Whether it be the Old Testament or the New Testament, as we are reading these stories of the journey of African people, we, we, we are reading the stories of God's chosen people. And in this moment, we began to realize that we can't both be inferior and in God's favor. For those two realities cannot coexist. You see, here at the Shrine of the Black Madonna, the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church, we seek to shatter this dichotomy and reject the lives that, that we have bought into. We know that the only way that we can do this is through a programmatic structure that exposes the lie for what it is in both content and context. It is a programmatic structure to expose what it is intended to do. And we must reject the lie for it intends to suppress our story. It is a lie that intends to suppress our oneness. It is a lie that is intent to, intended to suppress our purpose and our knowledge of self. Brothers and sisters, it's a programmatic structure 
that helps us get around the suppression of our greatness and our own inner divinity. It is only through a programmatic structure that we can accept, we can, we, we can share our acceptance rather of the false definition of ourselves, that false declaration of black inferiority, and become our best selves as we continually seek to become one with God and with our people everywhere. Amen and I share. At this time, brothers and sisters, if you're interested in being a part of our sacred movement, please take the time to click below or go to our website and click on the icon and join us. We welcome you into our community of faith in our community for the liberation of black people. Amen and I shall. Walk in the light, beautiful light. Come where the dew drops of mercy shine bright. Shine